Thanks, Ross. All right, I'm really excited to be presenting, um, especially right before Jeff Howarth. Uh, I was in Jeff's intro GIS class four years ago, so it feels poetic to present for the first time here right before Jeff. Um, today I'll be talking about Blender, which is really exciting software for 3D cartography and 2D cartography as well. Um, I was pretty optimistic with my, the number of slides, so I'll try and get through this. Uh, brief overview, I'll talk a little bit about what Blender is for those of you who haven't used it before. Um, a little about my own learning process um, and some experiments I've done. And then since it's PCD, I'll go into depth on some how-to for a bigger project I did with it and end with um, a little inspiration um, and warnings about getting addicted because it's really fun. So what is Blender? Uh, it's known as the Swiss Army Knife of 3D software. Um, most importantly for me, uh, it's free and open source, which is fantastic. Um, you can do all sorts of 3D modeling. Again? No. Uh, all sorts of 3D modeling uh, and animation in this software. Uh, it has its roots back in 1994. I think it wasn't open source then, uh, but we're on version 2.8 right now. Uh, many of you will probably know Blender for its hill shading capabilities as popularized by Daniel Huffman's uh, tutorial. Uh, how many of you have actually done that tutorial? Show of hands. Lots. Wow. Probably about 50. Uh, if you've never used Blender before, I'd highly encourage you to go do that tutorial. It's an awesome introduction. Um, and if you have done that tutorial and, like me, are indebted to Daniel, I'd encourage you to donate to him because he's incredibly generous uh, with his time and effort on doing these tutorials. Uh, so this is what the interface of Blender looks like. It's a little scary. There's about 4,000 different um, parameters you can change. But it also, the, the opening scene's pretty simple. It's just uh, a material, your cube, uh, a light source, um, a sun, and a camera. So basically, the idea is you have your 3D model, you have some kind of light source, and you take a photo of it. So pretty intuitive. But people do some really incredible things with Blender. Uh, this is not a photo. This is uh, 3D models of trees um, and lots of complicated light sources and uh, material composition. Uh, people make fantasy worlds. It's not all photorealism. You can do cool abstract stuff. Um, the Blender Foundation puts out um, sort of Pixar-esque uh, shorts every year, completely open source, um, and those are really inspiring. Um, so, but kind of scary. Uh, pretty complicated. There's about 200 nodes right there. So. A little discouraging, but also if there's one thing you take away from my presentation today, it's that I'm a complete noob at this, and I feel like I've been able to do some fun stuff with it. So my thought is if I can get 10% as good at 3D modeling and animation as these Blender gurus, then I'll be able to make some pretty cool maps. So I started simple. I started with Daniel's tutorial on uh, doing kind of basic 2D Hill shades, not really changing the default parameters that he suggests much. Um, and I see these all over. Lots of newsrooms uh, are using these for hill shades now. Um, it's a lot more aesthetically pleasing and uh, sensible than some of the other default hill shading algorithms that are out there. And I started experimenting, um, so playing with 3D views. Um, Glacier National Park was sort of my, my test area for a lot of these techniques. So 3D views. Uh, playing with materials. I don't know that there's actually a real practical use for making a landscape made of procedurally modeled obsidian, but uh, if you think of one, let me know. I sort of went through this with kind of blind faith that some of the things I was doing just for fun and experimentation would actually be useful down the line. So draping imagery over the terrain as well. Um, fly throughs, we'll see if this works. There it goes. Um, so this is animating the camera position uh, in Blender, inverting terrain. This is um, Lake Atitlan in Guatemala. Um, and I think this can be a cool tool for education. Certainly it's helped me learn some things. Um, this is animating the sun angle. Um, so I think this could be a cool tool for teaching uh, as well and just 
Uh, a lot of times when you're doing cartography, you're sort of playing with tweaking different parameters, and here you can kick out a whole animation and pick whichever, uh, whichever value for that parameter looks the best for your use. So as I did this, one thing I wanted to be able to do was quickly have a 3D model of any terrain anywhere in the world. Um, if you've done Daniel's tutorial, you know there's fairly significant work you have to do before actually getting to Blender. Uh, you need to find elevation data and you need to do a bunch of steps. Uh, often you have multiple tiles, you need to mosaic them, reproject, clip to your area of interest, uh, resample your data sometimes and stretch it. Um, so that's a lot of steps. Um, and so I wrote a bash script which automates some of that stuff. So now I just have to input uh, projection, uh, my DEMs, and a GeoJSON or shapefile with my desired project extent. Um, so you can find that um, on my GitHub at that link. Um, these are a couple spots I find elevation data. Um, Derek Watkins has a great interface for grabbing NASA's SRTM tiles. Um, Aster is another one that has global resolution, um, and then Earth Explorer for US data. Um, Josh Stevens is probably here somewhere. Um, he was kind enough to explain um, what are the differences between Aster and SRTM, since they're about the same resolution, but uh, Aster is better in some areas of the world where there's voids in SRTM. All right, so now I'll talk a little bit about a bigger project that I did. Uh, in this software, using this software. Oh my god. Sorry, I don't know why this is not staying on there. Capital S. Uh, okay, I've got it here. Um, so this is this sort of scrolly telling project I did, and it basically, oh god. Uh, would it help if people put their phones in uh, airplane mode, Ross? Maybe? Um, anyway, it's, it's sort of a tour of, um, of income inequality in Los Angeles, so it's this sort of abstract landscape um, where the height of each census tract is, um, set by its income. So rich areas are these tall skyscrapers and low, area, low income areas sort of turn into canyons. Um, and as you scroll, it sort of flies around this landscape, zooming in on different, on different neighborhoods. So like most good ideas, I was really excited. I thought, oh wow, this is such a great idea. Somebody else had already done it, of course. Uh, and Honestly, I saw his stuff and I was like, wow, that looks a lot better than mine right now. Uh, he did a great job, but rather than get discouraged, it was actually great. It motivated me to think um, how, I, how I could push this idea further. Um, and one thing I didn't love about his image, as beautiful it is, was that um, it's kind of abstract and I wanted to kind of get more in close and personal. Um, and taking the perspective views with the camera in and sort of focusing on specific neighborhoods. So the first thing I did was I grabbed census data. Um, if you want to um, visualize vector data in Blender, one way is you can bring it in as a raster. So I grabbed census data, joined with the Tiger cartographic shape files. Then I symbolize uh, as grayscale uh, based on the median household income. So white here is the wealthier areas and black is the lower income areas. I set my no, no, my no data value uh, equal to median US income as sort of a reference point, especially for the coastal areas. And then if you've done Daniel's tutorial, this will look familiar. I'm doing the same thing I do with a standard hillshade, just with my rasterized census data. I'm displacing a plane in, Bender, in, in Blender um, based on the uh, grayscale pixel value. So that gets this landscape um, with the rich areas sort of looking like skyscrapers. And the next thing I did in order to make the animations was uh, I animated the camera. You can actually animate just about any parameter in Blender. This uh, bottom window here is the timeline editor and that's where you set up animations. So you can 
go to the frame that you want. So I started at, um, at zero, and then you insert keyframes there for the parameters you want to animate. So for me, that was my camera location and rotation. Um, and then you move to the end of your animation. Um, I didn't quite know how many frames to use. It was kind of just uh, experimentation. Um, and I also animated my sun because I wanted the angle of my sun to remain at a static. Uh, I wanted the light source to be from the upper left as my camera animated. So I needed to animate the sun angle as well. And so that got me this here. Um, also, at the start of the animation, I start with this sort of growth um, up to sort of help orient the reader to the visualization technique that I'm using. This was inspired in part by a story by The Pudding. Um, they're awesome. If you haven't seen their stuff, they do a lot of really cool um, visual storytelling stuff on the web. And they had this story about uh, visualizing population in 3D, and they start in 2D before rotating down to a 3D view. And I really liked that as a way of orienting the reader to um, how to actually understand the visualization. So to do that, um, I, I animated a mix between two images. So one is my income data, and the other is just a flat image at sea level. Um, and just setting the mix between those two to start at completely flat image and then animating to the income image. Um, and it interpolates smoothly between there. So my final output was lots and lots of JPEGs. Um, I also added neighborhood labels from, and that data came from the L LA Times. Um, and in JavaScript, I tied the scroll um, as a user scrolls to actually um, actually change the source of the image. So it's really pretty simple code, um, but I think it had a pretty great um, effect. So all that code you can find at this link. It's on my GitHub uh, if you want to look at it. Uh, <laughs> so sometimes you have to make things that look really bad to make things that look OK. Uh, and to actually get uh, the neighborhood labels, I basically looked back and forth between a QGIS layout uh, with my neighborhoods colored and colored my 3D uh, image and then manually labeled stuff in Illustrator, which took a long time. Uh, I, I then load those labels at the stops between animations um, using New York Times AI to HTML tool. which ends up looking like that. So uh, caveats, this was extremely heavy to load client side. Um, in the future, I'd want to do a better job of optimizing the file sizes. You can also output MP4s, and I probably could compress those JPEGs further. Um, the fly-throughs can be dizzying, so I think there's accessibility issues, particularly for people who have vestibular disorders, um, people who get dizzy looking at that kind of stuff. Um, People have really strong feelings about 3D stuff. Uh, some people are super gung-ho, 3D all the time, uh, and others say we shouldn't use 3D ever because it introduces distortion. Um, I think a more reasonable position is to be somewhere in the middle. Um, there's pros and cons to it. Um, there is distortion. You can't see certain areas that are behind the rich areas. Uh, there is distortion. Um, so you can't necessarily accurately compare the values of two specific income tracks. But I think uh, John Byrne Murdoch from Financial Times said it really well um, about charts. And I think it's true for maps as well that our goal with this map isn't to compare particular values. It's to give an overall sense of the drastic differences in income that there are in really small areas. Um, and I would say of all the all the maps and stuff I've shared with family that aren't cartographers, this is the one that people have been the most excited about. So I'll end by just um, giving a shout out to a couple other people I've seen doing really cool stuff in Blender. Um, and these are their websites and Twitters. There's a lot of people doing much cooler things than I am in Blender, but I hope that this has given you a small taste of what you can do in Blender. Um, 
and incentive to go on your own cartographic adventures. And also, I'm trying to start a hashtag specifically for cartography in Blender. It has one tweet right now, so let's get this going. <laughs> All right, thank you.